That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about a personal favorite. Oh. Leave Her to Heaven, the 1945 uh, classic melodrama Technicolor Neo Noir directed by John M. Stahl, which makes its way to the Criterion Collection March 24th, 2020. What else has John M. Stahl done? Well, he's kind of an underrated director. Uh, before Leave Her to Heaven, he had done a number of uh, uh, productions that you'd call women's pictures, including Magnificent Obsession and Imitation of Life, both of which were later remade by Douglas Sirk. Okay. So the Imitation of Life you know is the Sirk. It's version. not his. No, but... Okay. And the film stars Jean, Jean Tierney. Jean Tierney, And yes. the gentleman? Cornell Wilde. Cornell Wilde. Uh, Jean, Jean Tierney. Tierney is beautiful. Oh, yes. She was known as, uh, I believe, the world's most beautiful overbite. <laughs> um, she, this is her one and only Oscar uh, nominated performance, uh, but she's in a number of notable... Uh, Who did she lose the Oscar to? Joan Crawford for Mildred Pierce. Well... And that bitch didn't even show up to the awards that year, as we all know. Joan deserved it, though. Jean is quite good in this. She uh, is. She, uh, d d her 1940s work was in a, num a number of notable film noirs. Um, Otto Preminger cast her several times and he was notoriously difficult to work with. But Laura, if you like Leave Her to Heaven, I'd really check out Laura. Uh, Whirlpool, Where the Sidewalk Ends. Uh, she got her start in a Fritz Lang film, The Return of Jesse James. She worked with Ernst Lubitsch in Heaven Can Wait, which is, of course was remade with Warren Beatty and then Chris Rock. Um, one of my favorites that I, I would love for uh, a remastering to surface is The Shanghai Gesture by Joseph von Sternberg um, with Ona Munson as uh, Madame Ginsling. Um, yeah, that Dragon Wick. I, I, but then, of course, uh, the late 1950s, she had a um, nervous breakdown uh, and then her career never really quite recovered after that. Okay. Why don't you describe what this film is about? This film, uh, well, it's based on the 1944 novel by Ben Ames Williams. And uh, a personal anecdote, uh, my grandmother, for whatever reason, who had her own library of books, was obsessed with finding copies of this book uh, in hardcover because we went to a lot of book sales. Mm -hmm. And she had several copies of it, and we would sit and read it aloud to each other when I was probably 10. I had no idea what I was reading then. Um, Anyway, uh, it's a frame narrative about an author who has married this woman who becomes his undoing. She's uh, obsessive, possessive, and uh, uh, eventually reaches beyond the grave to manipulate him. What's Jean's character's name? Ellen Barrett. So we find Ellen on a train. Well, the film starts with the main guy. What's his character's name? Uh, Richard is uh, released from prison. Released from prison. He goes back to this home he has and his lawyer, uh, played by uh, Roy Collins, who's in a couple of Orson Welles films. Uh, it's like, I'm the only one who knows the true story. And then we are... So we flash back to Ellen on a train. Yeah. She's on a train. She spies Richard. Richard spies her. Well, Richard spies her reading his book. So he's staring at a picture of himself. Right. She um, engages him and invites him back to her home? Um, he was going to meet them. Uh, he, he was already, once they get off the train, he's already... He already had plans yeah. to go. Mm -hmm. Oh, I missed that part. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he goes, they're having dinner, mm -hmm. and Ellen's ex-fiance shows up, played by Vincent Price. Vincent Price, yes. But there are a few things happen, but Vincent Price shows up, which he's obviously jealous to see this new man there. So she says, this is my new fiance. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Richard, uh, like, you know, play, like, basically play along. He does, but they're not playing. Like, they end up getting married. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's like everybody is kind of cowed by her. She's, it, even how... She's pushy. She, she's aggressive. She's put in the power position, and she's, she's kind of acting like a man. So, it becomes clear very early on that she wants Richard all to herself. Mm-hmm. Because uh, one of the most telling scenes initially is he says, like, oh, we need to get a housekeeper. Mm -hmm. And she says, no. I want to do everything. I'll do everything for you. And he's like, you're an idiot. <laughs> he calls him an idiot. Yeah. yeah, like, so they end up going to visit Richard's brother. Yeah, uh, they go to kind of... Uh, the fa His family's compound. Refuge, yeah, called Back in the Moon. He has a younger teenage brother who is uh, handicapable mm -hmm. and... She makes it clear that she doesn't really want the brother around. 
Yes. Along with her own mother and her own adopted sister. <laughs> like she really wants to be left alone with her husband. When she realizes that the younger brother might infuse himself into their lives, this bitch kills him. Yep, yeah, it's, it's in a very famous scene. A very famous scene on a lake uh, where she's got those famous eyes. Uh, it's the cover of the DVD yeah. box, but yeah, where she allows him to drown, which is pretty eerie because she's mm -hmm. very cold. But uh, moving on from that, everyone suspects she did it. Mm -hmm. So to backtrack, she when she first meets Richard, she tells him he looks just like her father. Mm -hmm. uh, and he does. So we, wait, why did I mention that? Anyway, we go back to, oh, I know why I mentioned it. Because her mom, I guess, knows or believes that Ellen, like, drove her father to death. Well, it's always hinted at that, like... Uh, that perhaps she killed him or drove him to kill himself. Yeah. We don't know, we, we don't know exactly Mrs. what Mrs. Barron, and she has an adopted sister, um... Ruth, played by Jean Crane, are very wary of her, and they're always hinting at things like, Ellen's just too much. She just loves too much. Everything's too much about it. So after Danny, the little brother, dies, they're really on edge mm -hmm. because they believe she did it. She had something to do with it. Uh, then the si their tension grows between her and her adopted sister because the sister becomes close with Richard, her yeah. husband. Mm -hmm. And it culminates in her reading her the insert to her husband's new book right well before this happens oh before this happens so this bitch becomes pregnant because that's the last because after the death of this brother he's kind of isolated and alienated himself and they go to live with her mother and sister uh, at their family home and uh she thinks the only way she can kind of get back to him is to become pregnant and they to surprise her redo ellen's father's dad's or Ellen's father's laboratory, mm -hmm. they kind of like gut it and make it a nursery, thinking that she'll love it and she hates when it. When she's already displayed, she does not like surprises. Doesn't like surprises. So of course she's mad. She starts acting out, basically saying like, this baby is gonna ruin my life. Mm -hmm. right? Like it's, she doesn't it's want it. holding her hostage. So she stages like an accident where she falls down the stairs, mm -hmm. obviously hurts herself, loses the baby. But getting back to, her husband's new book is dedicated to the girl with the hoe, mm -hmm. like the gardening hoe, which refers to Ellen's adopted sister. Mm -hmm. So, of course, Ellen is like, the fuck is going on? Then she confronts her sister and her sister is like, oh, I'm going on vacation to Mexico to some like random obscure town, That's which happens novel. to be the town that the novel is set in. So she is like, I know that you're in her mind. She doesn't say it, does she? Or does she accuse her sister of... I think it's clear that she's accusing her, yeah. She believes that her sister and her husband are having an affair. So to really get the final say, she stages... Well, the husband, Cornell Wilde confronts her and she admits to killing uh, her brother, his brother. Uh, and basically... Uh, to fully spoil the film, she poisons herself. So Ellen kills herself, but stages it so that her husband would be to blame. Her, her sister. And her sister. Yeah. Yeah. So the end of the film is them uh, going to trial. He only gets two years because he doesn't, he's not found guilty of murder. He's found guilty of not, Divul he, he, not divulging that he knew or believed that his wife killed his brother. Yeah. So he only gets two years in prison. He does the two years and then he's released. And that's him being released <clears throat> in the beginning of the film. This film is very good. Mm -hmm. It's like just exactly what you want from like, well, like good, like like just a great story, like classic Hollywood, like. Well, so it's a Technicolor film noir, and there are very few workable versions of of those. Another one might be Slightly Scarlet from Ellen Dwan in the fifties. Um, that, it, but it really works to highlight Tierney's beauty and how she kind of gets away with this. She's she is. Uh, a femme fatale like no other really because she's not driven by money or capital or safety like she she really is acting like a man and i think people would say she's a villain no i find her she's quite sympathetic really i don't find her sympathetic i think she uh the character does a very good job of expressing like the various facets of love mm -hmm. that we don't often talk about like the obsession and the selfishness and the so 
I kind of find her to be reptilian. Like, I don't think that she's good or bad. I think she's doing like what's important oh, yeah, yeah. to her. Um, it's a very powerful story. Yeah, she acts on impulse. She's all id, basically. But she's been allowed to be because of her beauty and, you know, this relationship she's developed with her father. Because uh, Vincent Price, her old fiancé, who she did pretty dirty, this fool represents the state in, in the trial for her murder. And he's very passionate about trying to, like, prosecute the sister and the brother. Like, he's still in love with her. Um, but yeah. I, uh, I don't know what else to say, except this is like a must-watch movie. Oh, yeah, for sure. This is a film that I keep coming back to, and uh, like every time I see it, I feel like I like it even more. It competed in Venice. Um, I don't know. I, I think Cornell Wilde, I don't find the most interesting lead. I, I think he was better served as his own director over the years, um, like particularly The Naked Prey, which is also available on Criterion. Um, I, I also find it funny there's a swimming competition between uh, Jean Tierney and some children and the observation is like, oh, she always wins, which, you know, decades later we'd have Mommy Dearest and yeah. the Joan Crawford connection. The DVD contains an insert with like a nice essay. Mm -hmm, by uh, author Megan Abbott. Um, uh, otherwise, there, this is actually kind of curiously, it's a 2K digital restoration, uh, but the only other... Um, feature on Criterion's disc is a interview with critic Imogene Sarah Smith. Anything else? No. So what would you give this film? Uh, four and a half out of five and the disc release four out of five. I would give it four out of five. All right, bye. Bye.